Okay, last lesson of our From Second Reich to Third Reich uh, study unit. Germany at war between 1939 and 1945. Let's have a look at the key questions for this lesson. How was the German economy organised in wartime? What impact did Allied bombing have on Germany? What was the condition of Germany in 1945? And why did Germany lose the war? Let's begin with a little look at some chronology. Again, you need to know some basic chronology in order to structure your understanding of the sequence of events. So let's have a whiz through some of the basic chronology. In 1939, the German invasion of Poland, which precipitates the war as Britain and France declare war on Germany. In 1941, the launch of Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, and the United States also entered the war after the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor and Hitler's declaration of war on the United States. In 1942, Albert Speer was appointed armaments minister, and you'll see he was quite effective in that role. In 1943, the first major loss of the German army, its myth of invincibility is shattered as the German Sixth Army is forced to surrender at Stalingrad in the Soviet Union. In 1944, the Allies invade France at D-Day, and in 1945, the invasion of Germany proper and the suicide of Hitler, Goebbels and Himmler. Let's move on now and look at an overview of the war in Europe between 1939 and 1945 and from the German perspective. And essentially, it can be divided into three phases a phase of conquest between 1939 and 1942, a phase of decisive reversals between 42 and 43, and the final retreat and inevitable defeat between 1944 and 1945. So let's briefly whiz through those. So the period of conquest between 39 and 41, 42, let's zoom in on this map of Europe. In 1939 was the invasion of Poland. The, the, Poland was defeated within a matter of weeks. Uh, in 1940, Norway, Denmark and the Holland followed in rapid succession, uh, followed by the invasion of France in June of 1940, of, again defeated in a matter of weeks, and the British Expeditionary Force was forced to in, into a humiliating retreat back to England at the, at the so-called Dunkirk operation. Uh, the German army, uh, well the German Luftwaffe rather, the German Air Force now turn their attention towards destroying the Royal Air Force of Great Britain in a prelude to a possible invasion. If they were going to invade they would have to destroy British air power. And between the summer and autumn of 1940 the so-called Battle of Britain raged over the skies of the United Kingdom which actually proved unsuccessful. Uh, Hitler turned now his attention back towards the east. If you remember one of his long-term strategies anyway is carving out Lebensraum for a new German Reich, uh, taking land in the east. And the invasion of Yugoslavia took place in 1941 and the invasion of Greece also in the same year. And in June of 1941 he launched the, the biggest ever military operation in the history of, of the human race which was the invasion of the Soviet Union in June of 1941. Let's have a look now at the period of decisive reversals. The Battle of Stalingrad was particularly significant. In order to try and secure the oil fields of Baku, um, Hitler was driving, he had three army groups in Russia. One army group was driving south to try and capture those oil fields to get the necessary raw material of oil to fuel the German war machine. And they felt that they needed to take Stalingrad if they were going to do that. Well, in the Battle of Stalingrad, they lost it eventually. The German Sixth Army was surrounded by Russian forces, uh, ordered to hold their ground, and in January 1943 they surrendered, as we say, shattering the myth of German invincibility. The Germans now organised a, a massive counter-offensive to hope to, to stem the, the, the retreat which was happening in 1943. So by the summer of 1943, Operation Citadel, they hoped to stem the advance of the Red Army. Uh, but it fails, and in a titanic battle, a battle of staggering proportions, the Battle of Kursk, the Germans suffer a decisive defeat in July of 1943. The numbers in this battle are literally staggering. Millions of men, thousands of tanks, and the Germans cannot possibly sustain the huge level of losses. 
they sustain in, in, in July of 43, it makes their defeat effectively inevitable. Uh, re reversals also in North Africa. Uh, the British defeat uh, German forces at El Alamein in October of 1943. And the North African campaign also draws away German forces and resources in that major battle, really, of the Second World War happening on the Eastern Front in Russia. Let's have a look at the final phase of retreat and defeat. Well, in June of 1944, the Allies land in occupied France at D-Day and begin to push eastwards through France, uh, the Low Countries, uh, and into Germany. And by mid-1944, the Red Army has pushed the Germans all the way through the Soviet Union and into Poland. And let's look at the final chapter now. The rush of the Red Army, so I say, was moving in from the east. The, 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 the German army at the time is mounting desperate uh, and very well coordinated uh, defences. There are huge casualties on, on all sides in this final phase of the war. But by April, the Red Army has reached Berlin. Soviet tanks and soldiers are fighting in Berlin, vicious fighting within Berlin. Uh, this is when the Hitler commits suicide and basically German surrender follows shortly after. Well, let's look now at some political developments during the war, precipitated by the war, things that happened during the war. In 37 to 38, uh, non-Nazi conservatives were removed from the German government. People that objected to the war, warned against war, thought it was a mistake, a, a wrong-headed policy, such as Hjalmar Schacht. So non-Nazi conservatives were removed. In 1939, the war starts, and it provides a smokescreen, a cover, and brings millions of unfortunates into German-occupied territory. It provides a cloak for the genocidal policies of the Nazis, a cloak for the Holocaust. If you remember, up to six million Jewish people are killed during the course of the war. As well, uh, people, the, the Roma and Sinti peoples, these are nomadic peoples, sort of stateless peoples within Europe, uh, are, are also killed on a huge scale. And the T4 euthanasia program, this is the murder of disabled people, took place. Hitler, during the war, basically disappeared from public view, um, disappeared into his bunker and his planning. He's, he's poring over maps and, and, and increasingly despairing over the military reversals in, in the second portion of the war. So no more of those rousing speeches from Hitler. Instead now, the sort of public face of the Nazi party is Goebbels. Josef Goebbels becomes the, the face that's witnessed by the German public mostly. Resistance to the Nazis, how did that change uh, between the period of the 1930s uh, and, and wartime from 39 onwards? Well, resistance was fairly limited in the 1930s mainly due to the effectiveness of the Gestapo, fear of the Gestapo and their, ne their network, their web of informers. The Gestapo had essentially crushed any resistance offered by the Social Democrats and the Communists, with the exception, actually, of a, of a communist resistance group called the, the Rotkapel, the, the Red Orchestra, and they weren't finally extinguished until 1942. Let's have a look now at a number of resistance groups. Well, during the war, there was an increase in resistance to the Nazi regime. A variety of groups with a variety of backgrounds and motivations for resistance. So let's have a look at three of those groups in a bit of detail. The White Rose Group, uh, you can see a picture there of Hans and Sophie Skoll. I can't remember the name of the other guy, apologies to him. The White Rose Group, they were a group of idealistic university students. They distributed uh, leaflets uh, in, in universities uh, throughout um, Germany and also sent out letters criticising uh, the Nazi regime and exposing some of the propaganda lies. In particular, they were critical of Nazi atrocities, uh, the treatment of the Jewish people, and also they, they, they exposed the extent of losses on the Eastern Front. We also had the, the Kreisau Circle, similar to the White Rose. Uh, they criticised Nazi atrocities. These though, weren't idealistic young university students. These were upper-class moderates, people 
senior within German society who despaired at what they saw as Nazi barbarity. They also saw what they perceived as the inevitable defeat, they were right in that, of the, the Nazi regime, and began to plan for a post-war Germany. Att attempted to reach out to uh, the Allies uh, and plan for a post-war Germany. By the way, all of these groups were eventually arrested and executed. There was also the Beck Gödeler group. These were a group of upper class nationalists. Now you might think these would have been allies of Hitler, but they despaired really at what they saw him doing in terms of leading Germany into defeat and disaster. Within the uh, Beck Gödeler group of upper class nationalists, there were some senior German officers in the German army, and the plan was formulated to assassinate Hitler and then sue for peace with the Allies. Let's have a look at one of the uh, plots which took place with the, the planning and assistance of the Beck Gödeler group, and that's the July plot of 1944, also known as Operation Val Valkyrie, or, or actually it was, a, it was a... I won't go into detail, we'll talk about that in class. Um, so, Beck and Gödeler had, as we say, some supporters within the Beck Gödeler group, rather, had some supporters within the senior ranks of the German military. But by, by no means all of the German military, but some senior members. And this officer here, Klaus von Stauffenberg, had become sickened by the treatment of Jews and civilians in Russia and, you know, deeply opposed to the war and agreed to take part in a plot to assassinate Hitler. So this is a picture of a room in the so-called Wolf's Lair in uh, eastern Germany, East Prussia, uh, a military base from which Hitler was coordinating uh, the, the, the defence of Germany against the advancing Red Army. Uh, Stauffenberg left a, a bomb in an attaché case under the table, left the room, uh, the bomb exploded and uh, it did actually kill four people but unfortunately, Hitler was shielded by a t one of the table legs of this rather sturdy table and survived with minor injuries. Well, the, the, um, they were arrested and executed, all of the, the conspirators there. Let's have a look now at the economy in wartime. How, how was the economy affected during the war? What, what efforts were made by the Nazis to keep the economy going? Well, they did make use of uh, some food and raw materials in the conquered territories. Let's uh, have a look at some of those. So they got coal and iron in particular from France when that was conquered. They got oil from the oil fields of Romania, uh, which was an ally of Germany during the Second World War. Although it wasn't enough to supply the needs of the German army uh, and industry. Uh, wheat was obtained from southern Russia, so they got hold of some raw materials in the occupied territories. Furthermore, they were able to capitalise on, they were able to use the industries of France and Belgium and convert those into industrial production for the German war machine and German economy. And they also managed to seize a large amount of... Uh, excuse me, a large amount of military equipment from the French, which they then uh, used in their own war efforts. By 1944, they'd also got 8 million slave labourers, largely from Eastern Europe, but also from other occupied territories, uh, and these slave labourers were used in German industry. They in fact comprised a fifth of the entire German workforce. These German slave labourers were used in German industries, such as in BMW, which was producing military vehicles, Sorry, when I earlier said uh, German slave labourers, I also said foreign slave labourers. Most were from the occupied territories of Poland. Uh, let's move on. Uh, so they also used slave labourers within uh, the chemical industry. IG Farben made extensive use of slave labourers, as did uh, Messerschmitt for making military aircraft, uh, and Krupps, uh, an armament manufacturer, also involved in exploiting slave labour and exploiting the inhabitants of the concentration camps and the death camps, obviously with the SS under Himmler. And slave labourers and the concentration camp inmates were involved in building projects, in producing clothing, furniture and in armed production. And these people worked in appalling conditions, extremely dangerous. Uh, lots of people died of, of mal malnourishment uh, and from industrial accidents and from being contaminated by, in, by hazardous materials. Pretty, pretty grim stuff there. Thing is, uh, in terms of the German economy, if we just look at it brutally in terms of the German economy, 
Yes, 8 million slave labourers, it's, it's a free uh, economic resource, a fr free labour resource. Uh, most of these were, however, unskilled. If you remember, one of the aims of autarky, of economic self-sufficiency, was to be non-reliant on foreign labour, foreign skilled labour. And they still did have a shortage of electricians and aircraft fitters, and obviously those are key people involved in uh, weapons production. Furthermore, in terms of oil, even with the, uh, in, it, that was in short supply, even in terms of the synthetic production that by no means met uh, the needs of German industry and the German war effort, uh, and also the Romanian oil fields at Ploesti, while being significant, did not meet the needs of the German industry and war effort additionally. Furthermore, uh, if you recall, the efforts to uh, capture the oil fields of Baku uh, failed with the defeat of the German army at Stalingrad. So they were left permanently from that time onwards uh, in a sh with a short supply of the vital uh, resource of oil. Let's have a look now at Albert Speer. So that's the gentleman on the left there, Albert Speer. He became armaments minister in 1942, effectively taking control of the German economy. Well, if you recall, um, Goering, Hermann Goering had become uh, chief of the German economy as plenipotentiary of the four-year plan, but he'd really fallen out of favour by 1942. The defeats at, uh, oh not sorry, D Dunkirk isn't a defeat, but the British managed to escape at Dunkirk, that reflected badly on the Luftwaffe. Also, um, as head of the Luftwaffe, the failure to defeat the RAF in the Battle of Britain reflected poorly on Goering as did the fact that his Luftwaffe, the, RA, the, the Luftwaffe fighters, were unable to prevent the bombing of German towns of city and cities. And he was effectively removed from significant posts and replaced in terms of running the German economy with Albert Speer. Well, Albert Speer was an extraordinarily effective thinker, planner and organiser. He was a realist. He realised in 1942 that the, the period of... Uh, rapid, quick and easy victories of the Blitzkrieg era was over. And in order to get the necessary materials and production to prosecute a war, they would have to re-jig, re-jig's re re a terrible phrase, I'm sorry, they'd have to reorganise the, the German economy on the, on the, along the lines of so-called total war, to commit German industry completely into war production. Well, they never completely managed that. But he was very successful in many, many ways. A lot of inefficient managers were sacked. Um, he reorganised um, the, 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 the overall organisation of the economy. He stopped the squabbling between different ministries uh, and rationalised the decision-making and production. And he was extraordinarily successful. By 1943, German armaments production had tripled. Still wasn't sufficient, as obviously, to win the war. Uh, he did that partly by concentrating production as well as increasing efficiency within certain, you know, gigantic factories and making use of slave labour. But ultimately, that even with these extra gains in production, it couldn't possibly match the industrial production of the Allies, and the effect of bombing was having a significant effect on German industrial production. So, sorry, moving forward, I'm not sure what I've done there. <laughs> Zip through these again, I'm not sure what I did. Uh, moving on to looking at that, so an overall summary of Speer. His contributions did allow the Germans to hold out longer. Without him, they probably would have collapsed far sooner. Uh, however, if we're going to judge uh, Albert Speer's contribution to the German effort, he, it simply delayed the inevitable. They could not prevent, it could not prevent defeat. Let's have a look at the impact of war. Military casualties were gigantic between 1939 and 1945, over 16 million men served in the German army. Uh, as you'll see yourself, when you research uh, statistics and casualties, the figures are different depending on the sources you look at. But around 3 million Germans were killed in action. A further 1.5 million were taken as prisoners of war. And many of those were taken in the Soviet Union and died in prison camps within the Soviet Union. Uh, this meant that um, there was a shortage of uh, men, essentially for the German war effort, for, 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 excuse my stuttering, there was a shortage of uh, men for the army, for, for, for fighting the war. And in 1944, uh, Hitler initiated the Volkssturm. This was kind of a, a home army, including uh, recruits as young as 16 and as old as 60. 
you can see here these individuals, probably what not ideal candidates for the army, quite old, old gentlemen holding uh, anti-tank weapons there. And the Volkssturm were used if, if especially heavily during the defence of Berlin in 1945. The, the Battle of Berlin, a horrendous battle, mass casualties both in, on, on the side of the Red Army and the German defenders. It's something of a, of a, of a question as to, as to why the Germans held out so long uh, when defeat was inevitable. Some of the uh, fighters were as young as 14 years old. Some were fanatical Hitler Youth volunteers. Some were simply press ganged into fighting and even executed in the streets, hung in the streets if they, if they refused to do so. Let's have a look at bombing now. Between 1943 and 1945, a bombing campaign was waged. The Americans bombed by day and the British Royal Air Force bombed by night. The Germans did have an effective and coordinated air defence system of uh, anti-aircraft anti flat guns and uh, squadrons of uh, Luftwaffe fighters who would mobilise and attack Allied bombers. But ultimately, they could not stem the flood of Allied bombers. 300,000 German people were killed, uh, largely civilians, uh, and over 750,000 wounded. A fifth of all housing within Germany was completely destroyed. There were two aims of the Allied war effort. One was to disrupt the production of the German war economy, and the second, slightly more controversial one, was to break civilian morale, destroy the will to fight of the German civilian population, and therefore hopefully precipitate an earlier end to the war. And in order to do that, there was some firebombing of German cities. Hamburg in July of 1943 and Dresden in February of 1945. Somewhat controversial, mass civilian casualties within these cities. Did it break civilian morale? Well, no. Similar actually to the Blitz uh, on London earlier on in the war during the Battle of... Clearly, people, it caused a lot of uh, death, suffering and misery. But people did unite together and, and try and clean up the mess and get on with their lives as best they could. Let's have a look now at refugees. The Wehrmacht, the German army in Soviet Russia between 1941 and 1944, had behaved with appalling brutality. Mass murder. It was, it was pitiless. It was, it was a, warfare, a war of racial extermination, essentially. They were ruthless and savage. And... Therefore, after 20 million, and an estimated 20 million deaths within the Soviet Union at the hands of the German army, as the Soviet army swept into Germany in 1945, they were in no mood to show any pity. There was a thirst for revenge. And the German population knew that. They had heard by this stage of, of the horrors that had been perpetuated by their own army and had no desire to ex experience the revenge of the advancing Red Army. So five million German refugees fled from the advancing Red Army into West Germany. Earlier on in 1945, and in the post-war period, this would place a great strain on the West German economy, as these millions of refugees obviously needed to find shelter, accommodation, food, employment and so on. Let's move on. Uh, women. How did the position of women change during the war? Uh, well, air raids were a, became a constant daily fact of life, trying to protect your family during those. It must be incredibly uh, terrifying. There was rationing of essential things such as food, clothing and fuel. Um, as we've discovered, just briefly, not, a, not a large increase in the number of women employed in industry. Uh, a particularly horrifying closing chapter of the war is that as Soviet soldiers uh, entered Berlin in 1945, it's estimated around 100,000 uh, Berlin, Berlin women element of war that often does happen. So I've got propaganda from 1943 onwards, sorry, Goebbels became the public face of the Nazi regime and released a constant stream of propaganda messages to try and keep the morale and fighting spirit of the German people up. Messages such as, you know, Germany will suffer total destruction at the hands of the Soviets unless we fight and win. This is a total war. Everybody must be committed and do their part. He warned about the perceived horrors of a Soviet invasion, which would mean the end of German civilization in his, his words. And he warned of the pitiless treatment that Germany would receive at the hands of the Soviets, therefore you know, hoping to increase the fighting spirit of the German population. He also tried to increase their their confidence and morale by promising miracle weapons which would help 
Germany to win the war. They did develop some fairly effective weapons. They were early exponents of missile technology with the V1 and V2 rockets, but these proved too little and too late, fortunately. Support for the Nazi regime, despite this tide of propaganda, did decline throughout the war, though, as suffering increased throughout the German population, inevitably news of military defeats trickled through, and the relentless bombing campaign took its toll. So overall, why did Germany lose the war? There are four main factors we can look at. Economic resources, effectiveness of the Allied forces, increasingly towards the latter stages of the war, Hitler's miscalculations and the bombing of Germany. Let's crack on and look at economic resources. Well, between 43 and 45, the German economy, in terms of its industrial production and its ability to wage war, is fighting three major industrial economies in Britain, the United States and Soviet Russia. And the American manufacturing capacity is so large and uninterrupted internally by war that they are also able to supply their allies with much needed industrial production to fight the war. So clearly a massive disadvantage for Germany in that one. And a, a direct quote from Stalin, this war will be won by industrial production according to Stalin. So Germany had a disadvantage in the size of its industries, the, the amount of uh, its population in terms of industry and fighting soldiers, and the amount of raw materials at its disposal. But there's a caveat here. We shouldn't just imagine that winning a war is purely a matter of industrial production, of spreadsheets, of simple mathematics. So if we think back to, you know, in other words, economic resources and industry is not a guarantee of success. If we think back to 1940, the combined economies and industry of Britain and France exceeded that of Germany, and yet they suffered rapid, stunning defeats in the Nazi blitzkrieg. So we shouldn't necessarily equate economic resources with an automatic guarantee of victory. Furthermore, the alliance between Soviet Russia and Britain and the United States wasn't a given. Stalin was deeply suspicious of Britain and the USA, thinking that they were essentially hoping that the, the Soviets would be destroyed by the Nazi war machine. And there's every chance that he might have made a separate peace with Germany. So no guarantees there. The Allies did become increasingly effective in prosecuting the war against the Nazi war machine. The, the German army was a formidable fighting machine. In between, as you remember, between 1939 and 1941, they had a series of quick, spectacular victories, employing very successful and effective logistics, military planning, using blitzkrieg tactics. A very effective combination of using rapid motorised infantry, and armour together with air support. Even in re retreat between 1942 and 1945 there were some very effective generals and, and the training and discipline of the German army made it a formidable enemy even in retreat. The thing is the, the Allied armies learned the lessons of defeat. Uh, they, they improved their, their, in terms of their military strategy and tactics. Uh, let's, get, let's have a, a look at uh, an example here. If we, get, if we look at the Eastern Front, in the early stages of Operation Barbarossa, the, um, the Soviet army took appalling casualties, appalling losses. Um, one, losses to an extent, it's, it's a testament to their willingness to fight that, that, that the Soviet Union didn't collapse. Four million soldiers were either killed or captured. And most of those are captured. It was a death sentence because they were simply left to starve to death. 8,000 aircraft, 17,000 tanks. I mean, the numbers are staggering and colossal. Yet the Soviets continued to fight. And much like the British and later on the Americans, they learned the lessons of those early defeats. They became much more effective. Inefficient generals were sacked. Uh, people were promoted on ability. Here's General Zhukov. Uh, a very famous Soviet general, instrumental in uh, the Red Army's defeat, uh, excuse me, the Red Army's um, victory over the Germans. The, the, so the Soviet soldier, in incredible ability to, to take privations, withstand pain, suffering, casualties, and carry on fighting. And of course, it wasn't just the Red Army, there were contributions from the British, uh, from the Canadians, from the Americans as well, but um, you can't deny the basic fact that they learned the lessons of defeat. Before I start talking too much nonsense, let's move on.
Hitler's miscalculations. Um, so these have been uh, identified uh, as a reason for the, for the German loss. Let's have a look at those. The first one, he believed that Britain would make peace after the rapid conquest of Europe, and that would leave him able to wage a war on one front with the Soviets. Instead, of course, uh, Britain didn't make peace. Uh, they fought the Battle of Britain and refused to surrender. And it left Britain essentially as a, as a, a land-based platform for the launch of the Allies from the West at D-Day. And therefore, he had to eventually fight the war on two fronts, which is a military planner's nightmare. Um, he underestimated Russia's capacity to wage war. Um, he stated uh, before the invasion, we have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. Well, despite the massive early success of, of, the, of the German army in the, in the early years of the war between 1941 and 1942, um, the Russia didn't collapse, it didn't cave in. Industry was relocated to the east and despite their, their appalling losses, the, the, the might of Russian industry was gradually mobilized against the Germans and more effective fighting tactics and strategies were used. Um, let's have a look. De the declaration of war on the United States. I mean, why did Hitler do that? Uh, the Japanese had attacked the American Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, but it wasn't necessary that Hitler declare war on the United States. As a result of that, they prioritized the defeat of Nazi Germany, even over the power that had attacked them, Japan. and having an ex the extra might of the industrial economy wage war on Germany, which may well have happened anyway, but there's no, that why did he precipitate it is, is perhaps a mistake. Why did he precipitate an enemy coming into the war with such a massive economy as the United States? Number four, Stalingrad. This is a kind of a strategic blunder on the behalf of Hitler. Sometimes in war, a, a wise uh, general, not that, I'm a, not that I'm an expert on these things, but this is what I've read, a wise general knows when it's time to retreat in order to preserve uh, men, material, resources. To, you know, to, so you lose land, but preserve more of your army to fight wage war in the future and perhaps have victories in the future. Well, at Stalingrad, um, Hitler refused the General Paulus's request and the Sixth Army to break out of the advancing Russian encirclement. And as a consequence, the Sixth Army was cut off in Stalingrad, surrounded, and over a period of horrendous fighting through the winter months, gradually um, the, the, the force of several hundred thousand was reduced by a factor of 90% and that they finally surrendered. Uh, only 16,000 sur survived the war out of a, an army of more than half a million. And this shattered the myth of German invincibility. The bombing of Germany, as we've said, was controversial. Um, civilians were part of the targeting package, and many, many, many were killed. It did, however, have effects. It reduced the productive capacity of German industry by 20%. Furthermore, it diverted the remaining industry away from the using the raw materials and economic capacity and production to producing armaments towards repairing damaged factories. So a second ancillary factor there. As well, the German Luftwaffe, the, the German Air Force, instead of uh, being able to support the German army effectively, uh, was used to, to try and deter Allied bombers over the skies of Germany. So, you know, the Luftwaffe fighters were scrambled largely for that purpose and therefore couldn't support German ground forces as they had done very effectively in the earlier Blitzkrieg campaigns of 1939 to 1941. So I hope you've made uh, notes on, on, those, on those ranges of uh, factors, and I'll see you in the lesson.